I'm sorry for the slight delay in, uh, in starting, but we're ready to, to go now once uh, Mary has asked you to take the oath, uh, and then uh, you'll be asked questions by Ms. Fraser Butlin. Thank you, sir. Now, although there's uh, a select small group here in, in all of which uh, there is a much larger audience online who will be waiting to hear what you, what you have to say. Yeah, so I understand. Thank you, sir. Mary. Please state your full name. David George Bocod. Take the book in your raised hand and repeat after me. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Dr. Bogod, I'd like to just start with a brief overview of your career. You qualified in 1980. Yes. And started training as an anaesthetist in 1982. Yes, that's correct. And you were appointed as a consultant anaesthetist at Queen's Medical Centre and City Hospital in Nottingham in 1989. Yes, that's right. And you retired uh, in July 2020, having remained in Nottingham since then. Yes, that's correct. When you were a consultant anaesthetist, so from 1989 through to 2020, uh, you worked between two and four sessions a week as uh, an obstetric anaesthetist. Is that right? Yes, and I would regard that as my specialty interest. Uh, can you help us with what the responsibilities are of, of an obstetric anaesthetist? So, um, uh, in consultant-led units in the UK, uh, at the time in question, and certainly now, uh, there's a 24-7 presence of a duty anaesthetist at all times uh, for providing um, epidural pain relief, for obviously providing anaesthesia for caesarean sections and other operative interventions, uh, but also to deal with acute emergencies and to be part of the team caring for uh, obstetric patients who are sick for other reasons, such as the cardiac disease that Professor Steer uh, specialises in. And when you speak of acute emergencies in the obstetric unit, would that primarily relate to postpartum hemorrhage? Uh, the, the commonest acute emergency in an obstetric unit is, is a, a severely compromised fetus that needs delivery rapidly, nearly always by caesarean section. Uh, and, of course, some of those cases will lead to obstetric hemorrhage as well. But we'll see um, uh, three or four, perhaps, uh, extreme emergency caesarean sections in any 24-hour period in an average-sized unit, and that would be our commonest emergency. You were the lead obstetric anaesthetist for around 13 years. Yes. What additional responsibilities did that mean you held? Uh, primarily, it's the, uh, the administrative management of the obstetric anaesthetic service and delivering that to the, to the trust as a whole, or actually more to the, uh, the head of anaesthesia who then delivers it to the trust. So it's more of an administrative than, a, uh, than being the senior clinician. It, it, it's, a, it's, a, yes, it's a more managerial post, I would say. Before we uh, talk about the specific context of when an anaesthetist would be involved in giving a blood transfusion, I want to just first explore your understanding and knowledge of the risks of viral transmission uh, by blood. First of all, when you were in medical school training in the late 1970s, do you have any recollection of what you were taught uh, about the risks of a transfusion? Uh, I think there was much made, and this is probably a recurring theme, I think, in uh, the way anaesthetists manage blood transfusion, there is uh, much concentration on the risks of uh, incompatibility uh, and the, uh, the complications that can arise from, uh, from uh, rapid transfusion. Uh, I think I would have been made aware, though I can't remember it specifically, of the risks of disease transmission. Uh, and that would have inclu be, been included bacterial transmission as well as viral. Uh, but uh, it certainly wasn't a, a major part of the curriculum. And then uh, when you started your anaesthetics training in 1982, you've said in your statement uh, that one of the key books is something called a synopsis of anaesthesia. Yes. We have a copy of it, and I'd just like to turn up a couple of pages from it. Um, WITN 6975005, please. 
And if we turn directly to page uh, 447, please, Sally. Thank you. Thank you very much. We can see, sorry, I should have said, this is part of a chapter dealing with intravascular techniques and intravenous therapy. And in the page prior, there's a subheading of blood transfusion and there's some history given. And we see on the right-hand side of this page the heading complications. Each blood transfusion carries a certain risk. And in adults, single bottle transfusions are seldom necessary. Yes. Then if we turn the page... On the right-hand uh, side, we see number seven, transmission of disease, uh, and a list is given. Serum B hepatitis, Australia antigen, six to 16 weeks afterwards, and anecteric hepatitis can occur. Uh, malaria, syphilis, yours, relapsing fever, calaaza, bacteremia or septicemia, cytomegalovirus, Epstein-Barr virus infection, and then there's a reference of... Uh, malaria. Um, this, this is 1982. Yes, that's correct. And they're still talking about single bottle transfusions. Yes, they are actually. Uh, it's um, uh, though my recollection by 1982, which is the uh, yes, my, my earliest time as a trainee anaesthetist, is that the blood was provided in bags then. The, the book in question, this one I provided to the inquiry, is uh, uh, it was an absolutely standard textbook in use at the time, but it, did, it has um, some slightly eccentric characteristics to it. The, the two authors uh, tended that they, they wrote the entire book themselves, and there were, there were some uh, slight anachronisms cropped up from time to time, and that's probably one of them. In terms of the risks of transmission of disease... I think you said that this was the basis of your understanding of the risks of transfusion, uh, blood transfusion. Yes, of course, we had no, no notion of uh, non-A, non-A, non-B hepatitis now, now known as hepatitis C in those days. So in 1982, there wasn't a discussion of non-A, non-B? No, I don't think so. It might not have been called hepatitis C? No, it certainly wouldn't have been called hepatitis C. I, think, I was thinking of, the, uh, of non-A, non-B and whether I was aware of that at the start of my training, I don't think I was. Do you have any idea of when you did become aware of non-A, non-B? I'm going to say later in my training, though, that uh, that is relying on a distant recollection, and I wouldn't put a huge amount of weight on it. And your training ran from 1982 to 1989? yes. So at some point in that time frame... I, yeah, I, that's, I have a, a memory, I think, of it cropping up during my training, but I, again, I wouldn't, uh, would certainly mm. wouldn't uh, want to uh, stake my life on it. But certainly in 1982, it's not in the standard text no, no. that anaesthetists were using? No, absolutely. And in terms of your awareness of the risk of AIDS, mm. do you recall when you came to be aware of that risk? Um, Well, whenever the, uh, the AIDS crisis hit, and that was, what, the early 1980s? Uh, I think it, it became apparent very early on that there was likely to be a significant risk from uh, with a blood carrier disease, or amongst other forms, and it was, uh, there, there must have been a risk arising from it, and we were certainly aware of that risk. There was a lot of concern, as I've expressed in my, uh, in my statement, uh, amongst healthcare workers anyway, who were uh, regularly exposing themselves to, pa- to patients' blood. Uh, and uh, yes, we were certainly aware that it could be transmitted via uh, transfusion as well. What you've said in your statement is that from the outset, uh, in the early 1980s, it caused considerable personal concern to those of you involved with vascular procedures such as cannulation. Um, yes. And is that the context in which your awareness of uh, AIDS I think arose. Uh, certainly, it made more of an impact uh, upon us uh, in the medical profession than uh, any other bloodborne disease. I think, partly for the selfish reason that we were very concerned about catching it ourselves. Throughout your training uh, as an anaesthetist, did you have any training input from haematologists, for example, from the Regional Transfusion Centre or uh, haematologists within the hospitals? 
I, my brief answer to that would be no. I think we, I, I certainly attended lectures by haematologists at national and international conventions of anaesthesia and obstetric anaesthesia, but they were primarily, in fact, entirely related to management of rare haematological conditions rather than uh, massive, obst massive obstetric hemorrhage. And you've said in your statement that you were always aware of the potential risks of transmission of disease, that you knew that those risks were small, and you were aware that the blood transfusion service was continually taking steps to recognise new risks and to mitigate them. How did you come to have that understanding? I think it, was, it, it would have been common knowledge amongst those of us working in healthcare at the time that, there was a, uh, that, there, that, that the blood transfusion service was... Uh, was very much a safe, seemed to us very much safety based and was always trying to mitigate risk associated uh, with uh, transfusion of blood and blood product. Um, and uh, we saw that particularly in the processes we had to go through to obtain blood and blood products for our patients, which were often uh, quite uh, uh, complex. Uh, but we, yes, we were certainly also aware that there, there was work going on to screen for disease. But there was no more formal uh, structure by which that information was passed to anaesthetists? Not that I can recall, no. Uh, the inquiries looked at various versions of a booklet called Notes on Transfusion, and, and later it became the Handbook of Transfusion Medicine. I'd like to just look with you at the 1989 version. Yes, of course. PRSE uh, 303047, please. This uh, version, as I say, was published in 1989. Was this something that you were ever provided with? I don't recall having seen it before starting to read around the topics in anticipation of this uh, of today, no. And if we just turn to um, page... Uh, sorry, sir, can I just take a moment? My page referencing has gone wrong. Yes, thank you. If we just turn to page uh, six, please. No. We can see that at the top it was intended for use by medical and other healthcare personnel uh, as a source of information about blood component therapy and the clinical use of plasma fractions. Um, and then if we carry on to page 29, please. We have a, a, a set of uh, information about infectious, infectious agents uh, transmitted by transfusion. Uh, we see it sets out hepatitis B, hepatitis non-A, non-B, HIV-1 and HTLV-1. Um, do you recall receiving any specific training uh, about from haematologists? I think the answer you've probably already given, but from haematologists in relation to infectious agents transmitted by infection? No, no, certainly not, and, and I don't recall ever seeing this handbook either I, it, it, I, in, it, I, I suspect it probably didn't penetrate very far uh, into the medical profession despite its best intentions now moving on to the more specific detail of um, anaesthesia and obstetrics in obstetric care when would it be the anaesthetist rather than the obstetrician who made decisions about whether to give a blood transfusion and which blood components to give? Um, so the majority of uh, transfusions that we gave in the obstetric arena, and certainly the majority of blood and blood product, were given in response to uh, emergencies arising uh, from peripartum hemorrhage, essentially post postpartum hemorrhage, or hemorrhage at the time of birth, um, usually during cesarean section, but sometimes, uh, again, completely unexpectedly during uh, a, a vaginal childbirth. Um, and uh, um, blood can be lost, as I'm sure you've already heard, very, very rapidly indeed uh, during childbirth when things go wrong. Um, and um, the anaesthetist on the labour ward would be called as part of the response to a massive haemorrhage in a labour room during a, a, a vaginal delivery, and, of course, would be the clinician in charge of the care of the patient during a caesarean section as well. So those are the two main times. And of those, I would say that it's the caesarean section scenario that was by far the most common. 
You've said in your statement that by the time you were in practice in 1989, whole blood was rarely used. Yes. And that packed red cells were used uh, instead. Is, is that right? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. And then I just want to turn with you to some uh, guidelines to explore um, whether uh, these were guidelines that anaesthet obstetric anaesthetists uh, were using. Could we turn to NHBT 5037 underscore 013, please? We looked at these this morning with Professor Steer, and they are the guidelines for transfusion for massive blood loss published by the British Society for Haematology in 1988. And if we see at the bottom of the page, the definition of massive transfusion in these guidelines uh, is uh, where a volume equal to the patient's total blood volume is uh, lost in less than 24 hours. But it yes. does then go on to talk about obstetric patients presenting with overwhelming hemorrhage. Yes, we, certainly the patients we would regard as having a, a massive blood loss will be losing blood much, much faster than that. Faster than a total, losing a total blood volume in less than 24 hours? Oh, goodness me, yes. A patient could lose their total blood volume in, in an hour or less in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, a serious obstetric scenario. One, about one quarter of the entire cardiac output from the heart is pumped to the, to, to the uterus at term, to the gravid uterus. And blood loss can be absolutely torrential. So in those circumstances, as an, as an anaesthetist, if we just come out to the whole page, please, Sully, was this a set of guidelines that you would have been familiar with? No. We were, I've never seen those before at all. Uh, and uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, I mean, they're, they're published in a, 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 certainly a journal which I wouldn't have been familiar with. I don't know whether they had an existence outside the journal. They may well have done, but they didn't come to us. But I don't. Have it, I've, I have read them as part of the preparation for this uh, for today, and I didn't see anything in there that, that, that surprised me or that, that, that countered the sort of treatment that we were giving. For, those, for the purposes of those listening, I'd just like to take you to a couple of parts of it and conf and, and explore with you whether there's anything that, that's different to your practice. Yes, I'll course. do that in, in one go, if, if I may, and that is page five. We see a heading, a management strategy for massive transfusion, sequence of components, treat profound hypertension speedily, prompt administration of any infusion fluid is preferable to delay. In preference order, give crystalloids and synthetic colloids up to 40% blood volume, followed by 4.5% albumin. Initial red cell replacement can take the form of red cell concentrates, but if bleeding continues, it may be more sensible to supply whole blood. Does that broadly accord with your practice? Uh, of course, that's certainly how we were practicing at the time. It changed mm -hmm. uh, significantly since then. So the use of, uh, of synthetic colloids and certainly 4.5% mm -hmm. albumin have pretty well gone by the board. But in 1989... In 1989, yes, that would have been uh, quite a good summary, yes. And then if we just turn to page 8. When to give components... Uh, we see uh, that for massive uncontrolled traumatic hemorrhage, maintenance of full hemostatic competence by means of component therapy may be unrealistic. In this situation, the priority is for major vessel bleeding to be stemmed surgically. Combinations of stored whole blood, red cell concentrates, colloids and crystalloids should be used to maintain blood volume or pressure and haemoglobin or hematocrit values of greater than 7 or 0.25 grams per deciliter respectively. It's pre preferable to conserve use of limited supplies of fresh blood, plasma or platelets until the haemorrhage shows signs of control and uh, when the rate of blood loss is substantially lessened and after <coughs> major vessel bleeding is under control, it becomes worthwhile attempting to correct uh, haemostatic abnormalities. Again, does that accord broadly with your practice in 1989? Yes, I think that's right. There was uh, Certainly there was... Um, we would have accepted there was little point in trying to... to boost the haemoglobin level up very uh, to a high to a high normal level or anywhere near it at the time the patient was bleeding because then they would simply bleed a greater concentration of red cells than they were bleeding if they were diluted uh, so you would often uh, the, the the main purpose of the exercise in a massive hemorrhage of this nature would be as they say correctly here to stem the bleeding uh, while we maintain life support uh, 
and then to correct matters thereafter. The only thing I would say is that uh, in order to surgically stem the bleeding, you, you need inherent coagulation ability of the blood as well. And so uh, uh, coagulation, procoagulation factors would be given relatively, well, even at the time the patient was bleeding, as part of the attempt to control it. And then if we um, move forwards in time uh, quite considerably... BSHA 5043 underscore 001, please. BSHA 5043 underscore 001, please. Again, these are uh, guidelines from the British Committee for Standards on Haematology uh, from 2006 dealing with um, management of massive blood loss. Again, did these guidelines come to your attention? No, I don't recall these. And if we turn to page two, we can see table one, which is a summary of key recommendations. And if we could just zoom into the second half of the table, where it starts maintain a haemoglobin at greater than eight. Thank you. Uh, we see here the uh, goal of maintaining uh, haemoglobin at greater than 8, maintaining the platelet count at greater than 75 uh, times 10 to the 9 per litre, maintaining PT and APTT, um, prothrombin and... Uh, activated partial thromboplastin, Tom. Thank you, sorry, I just need to check my note. <laughs> um, <laughs> at less than 1.5 times the mean control and maintaining fibrinogen to greater than one gram per litre and then avoiding uh, DIC. Absolutely. To what extent does this accord with the obstetric uh, and anaesthetic practice in 2006? Yes, uh, again, I, wouldn't, I, I don't think we would have concentrated on maintaining the haemoglobin at a given level, partly because during the acute crisis, the haemoglobin is a very poor measure of how well restored the blood volume is anyway. Uh, our concern is, would be much more about maintaining a, an adequate circulating volume while maintaining supply of oxygen to the tissues, keeping the acid base balance as normal as we could, uh, maintain, and thus maintaining vital signs. Uh, but the rest of that sequence, yes, I think that's correct at the time. Uh, over the years, probably the, the acceptable platelet count has come down and the fibrinogen level has gone up, but those are, uh, uh, appropriately reflect the practice at the time, yes. And in terms of maintaining circulation, what components would you be using to do that? That's, in, that's in, so entirely done by fluid. You need to have the correct volume in the circulation. And part of the problem, of course, is that the fluids that we give to maintain circulating volume don't stay, the clear fluids, don't stay in the circulation for long. So they are a stopgap measure, partly because of that and partly because they don't carry um, oxygen uh, to, the, to the tissues. And that, that, of course, is the danger of the haemoglobin dropping dramatically. So if you, for the sake of argument, lose your entire circulating blood volume and replace it entirely with clear fluid, that's, not a, that, that's clearly not going to be compatible with life. So some haemoglobin level must be maintained. But as a stopgap while bleeding is stemmed, the focus of the anaesthetist is on that fluid. Yes, yes, maintaining, maintaining circulating volume. And then if we turn to RLIT 40946, please. Uh, we have the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists Green Top Guideline. It's the first edition of the guideline on prevention and management of postpartum hemorrhage. Yes. Would this have come to your attention? Yes, I was familiar with this. Uh, and so things that were related to the obstetrics Obstetrics did reach the obstetric anaesthetists. Uh, yes, and I think there was an anaesthetist on this working party anyway, from what I recall. Can you recall how this came to your attention? No, I'm afraid I can't. Would it have been in, published in a journal that you read, or was there a mechanism in the hospital? Do you just have no, no recollection? This, this wouldn't have been published in a journal. Uh, it, the most likely route, I suspect, would have been uh, informally through my, my obstetric colleagues. <laughs> And if we turn to page uh, seven, please, we have uh, in bold uh, the basic measures for minor postpartum hemorrhage and then the full protocol for major postpartum hemorrhage. Uh, 
uh, and particularly the bottom half, fluid therapy and blood product transfusion. Uh, we looked at this uh, this morning uh, already, but in terms of um, blood, it's indicating that it should be cross-matched uh, or otherwise uh, giving uh, ORHD negative blood. Fresh frozen plasma, four units for every six units of red cells. Yes. Platelets, uh, the platelet count needs to be, uh, if, it's <clears throat> less, if the platelet count is less than 50 times yes. 10 to the 9. Cryoprecipitate if fibrinogen is less than one gram yeah. per litre. Then, if we go over the page, uh, sorry, I should have asked you about that bold. Does, does that re represent an accord with your practice? Yes, again, you can see that the, 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 the trigger level for platelet transfusion has come down, as I, su I suggested. Uh, and, and really, within a couple of years of this, the, the fibrinogen, it was felt the fibrinogen level should be higher than one. So 1.5 was used as a standard. But again, for the standards of the time, that's about right, I think. And notice that there's a reduction in the, uh, in the focus on, on, on colloid. So, so up to two litres of crystalloid should be given. Uh, and colloid has sort of come down the, the step a little bit. And, and in the years after this, uh, the use of colloid has, has pretty well uh, been abandoned because it's, uh, it was considered it has too many risks associated with its use. Um, and then we turn the page... Uh, and we see that the cornerstones uh, of resuscitation during um, PPH are restoration of both blood volume and oxygen carrying capacity, yes. which I think is, is what you were telling us uh, earlier. Uh, volume replacement must be undertaken on the basis that blood loss is often grossly underestimated. Yes. Compatible blood supplied in the form of red cell concentrate is the best fluid to replace major blood loss and should be transfused as soon as available if necessary. The clinical picture should be the main determinant for the need of blood transfusion and time shouldn't be wasted waiting for laboratory results. And then we'll come to the point about obstetricians and, and anaesthetists working together in a moment. And then there's the um, reference back to the 2006 British Committee for Standards in Haematology main therapeutic goals. If we can just go down a little, Sully. Uh, we see those uh, suggesting that haemoglobin should be greater than 8 Etc. Yeah, so they, they, they slightly contradict the, the statement on the previous page, but yes, I think that's right. That is a, a reflection of how things changed, I suppose, over that period. In your statement, you've said that if transfusion were required uh, to be given by an anaesthetist, two units were always given. Is that right? Uh, I think I said... I, I may have said that. I, 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 I think I may, Was I, this in the section about single-unit transfusion? Yes, indeed. Yeah, it would certainly be very unusual to give a to give a single unit of blood. And is that because of the particular context that anaesthetists are working in? So yeah, so if an anaesthetist is giving blood during uh, surgery, then it's because substantial volumes have been lost uh, and the patient is in a dire situation, and it will always need more than one unit, usually more than four units uh, in a situation like that. Um, but there was also a. From the earliest time I can remember, a general injunction out there that you don't give a single unit of blood to an average-sized patient because if that's all they need, then they probably don't need it in the first place. Was there ever consideration giving, given to giving one unit and then making the decision to give the second unit, depending on the patient's response? I was pondering this myself, actually. I, I, I don't think that that was something that was emphasised and interestingly, perhaps, uh, partly I think as a result of this inquiry and our understanding of it out there in the, the NHS community, there's probably more of that going on now. So I've certainly uh, anecdotally seen situations where patients who are in whom it felt probably two units might be needed in a non-emergency situation are given a single unit first and then assessed and found to be in a satisfactory state thereafter. And so the second unit isn't given. So if anything, perhaps single units are given more frequently now than they were. But in the context of an obstetric anaesthetist, mm. how realistic would that approach have been? Um, in, the, in the emergency situation we're talking about, no, that wouldn't have been realistic at all. Usually, when there's a major obstetric hemorrhage on the operating table, you will send to blood bank for four units of blood as a routine. We saw in these guidelines, uh, we can take them down now, Sally, that the question of um, blood loss often being grossly uh, estimated incorrectly. Yes. Um, and you've said that over time, anaesthetists got better at estimating blood loss. 
Well, it wasn't just anaesthesia. I think we all got better at it. So it's, this is very... I was in the room to hear Professor Steer's final evidence, and the, the, he was emphasising the importance of teamwork. And in the case of a massive obstetric hemorrhage, teamwork is absolutely vital. And it's the members of the team, uh, particularly the, the theatre team, who will uh, rapidly assess blood loss and report it back to the anaesthetist uh, and the obstetrician as well. Uh, so, yeah, we did get better at it. Uh, we got better at... Uh, it's much easier to measure blood when it's, been, when it's being spilt but collected into a suction apparatus, for example, uh, which, is then, which is calibrated so you can see how much is lost. Um, and the more that can be collected that way, the, the, be the more accurately it can be measured. It's much more difficult to measure it when it's spilt on the floor. Um, and it's easier to measure... Uh, on when it's soaked into swabs as well than it is on the floor and we got better at weighing swabs rapidly and estimating blood loss from that um, and also I think because we became aware over a, a substantial period that there was a tendency to underestimate blood loss we would often take that into account when calculating blood loss so, so am I right in understanding that the, th the three things that changed over time in terms of estimating blood loss was the greater use of um, suctioning to, to scoop it up, the weighing of swabs, and the awareness of underestimating. Yes, and I should say, actually, that surgical drapes, for example, were modified to allow blood that was spilt from the wound to collect in gutters, which could then be suctioned rather than to fall onto the floor. So there's a lot of, of, of small advances made a difference in that. But I think primarily it was our, our understanding that we, were, we had a tendency to underestimate. And then if we can turn uh, to DHSC 002 0813 underscore 059, please. Uh, this isn't specific obstetric guidance, but it is specific anaesthetic uh, guidance from September 2001. Uh, is that something you, you would have seen? Uh, but I think my name might even be in it. Indeed. <laughs> so, yes. Yeah, so and then I... we turn to page six. Uh, and we see the recommendations that the decision to transfuse should always be made on an individual patient basis. Patients should not be transfused to achieve a normal haemoglobin concentration. Anaesthetists should play a lead role in ensuring good preoperative assessment and preparation. Departmental guidelines should be drawn up on matters of blood transfusion and be readily available for reference. There should be a permanent record of the administration of each unit of red blood cells. The reason for pre- and post-operative transfusions should be recorded in the clinical notes. Local surgical blood ordering schedules should be developed and red cell use should be audited regularly. And every hospital transfusion committee should have a representative from the Department of Anesthesia. Yes. I'm going to come back to a number of those uh, over the rest of the afternoon. But... In terms of your non-obstetric practice and the more controlled settings where blood transfusion might be given, uh, what relevance did the haemoglobin concentration have to the assessment of giving a blood transfusion? Are we talking about uh, patients in, the, in uh, 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 before, before surgery? Indeed. Um, so, well, very little, actually. So, so uh, I think firstly because we would rarely encounter patients whose haemoglobin was low that it would be so low that it would be a significant concern to the anaesthetist. Uh, and also because over, certainly over time, the idea that you had to have a fixed level of haemoglobin before you entered surgery became uh, less and less important. Uh, and most of the surgery that I was involved in outside the obstetric arena did not involve the spilling of large quantities of blood anyway. And it's, so whether a, a preoperative haemoglobin was acceptable prior to surgery was partly dependent upon the type of surgery that was being performed. Was it anticipated that it would be complex, that it would involve significant blood loss and so on? Uh, and the kind of procedures that I was doing, it really, they <coughs> didn't involve much spillage of blood. And just so that we complete the picture of what the guidelines say, mm. if we can turn to page uh, nine, please. Uh, clinical indications. Uh, several factors need to be taken into account before considering transfusion, uh, and it indicates so much of what we were talking about yesterday, but specific for anaesthetists. Clinical experience has shown that blood loss of 30% uh, can be treated with crystalloid or colloid solutions alone. Um, a large retrospective observational study showed there was no increase in mortality, provided the haemoglobin concentration was kept above 8. 
even in an elderly population, it's been suggested that a haemoglobin concentration above 8 is sufficient even in patients with severe cardiorespiratory uh, disease. Yes. Uh, and that, and that uh, I, I think, reflects something I said in my statement to the inquiry, that in general, the, the sort of trigger levels for transfusion uh, and acceptable haemoglobin concentrations during my time of practice fell consistently over that period. And that's reflected in the guidelines that were given to anaesthetists that's right. generally? Yes. I want to return to the obstetric context and particularly the emergency uh, scenarios we were speaking about a moment ago. When blood was required to be given by an anaesthetist in that emergency context, um, what would be recorded in the medical notes about the transfusion? So we, would, the, uh, we were enjoined quite correctly by our haematology department to ensure that every unit of blood or blood products transfused into the patient was recorded not just as a fact but also the, the, uh, the batch number and so on uh, and the time at which it was started and finished and all that would be recorded in the, in the records and that was the same from the start of my practice to the end of it. Um, the reasons for blood transfusion, well, they were, they were obvious because you would record the blood loss of the patient as well. And, and uh, during complex, uh, relation to complex surgery, there would be significant notes made by both the obstetrician and the anaesthetist about the, uh, the issues that were encountered that caused the bleeding. And whose responsibility was it to make sure that the fact of the transfusion and the batch numbers were in those medical notes? Uh, during surgery, that's the anaesthetist's responsibility. Um, was there any process within the hospital to cross-check that those details had been entered into the medical records? Uh, so every, uh, the, as uh, Professor Steer alluded to, every unit of blood or blood products administered to the patient would be double-checked uh, by the, usually the anaesthetist and AN other, often the operating department practitioner. Um, I don't think there was a formal method for confirming that the correct details had been recorded in the patient record, though. In your statement, you've said that, um, uh, in fact, you said it this afternoon as well, that often four units would be, uh, would be ordered. Uh, but you said in your statement that blood that was no longer needed was then returned to the blood bank. Yes. Are you aware of whether this was effectively checked back in at the blood bank for later use for yes. other patients? Uh, it was certainly checked back in. I mean, the, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the route taken by blood once it left blood bank was very, very carefully controlled. Uh, and times in and out uh, were important right at the start of my career and became increasingly important as time went on, uh, the so-called uh, um, 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 cold chain process. Uh, so, yes, the, the, when the blood was taken back to the blood bank, having not been used, uh, then they would want to know that it had been kept in a cold environment at an appropriate temperature uh, and the exact time at which it was returned to their blood bank storage. And who was responsible for providing that information to the blood bank? Well, obviously, we would, we would record where, where the blood was and, uh, at the time when it was in, in our hands, uh, but it was usually transported back to blood bank by a porter, uh, and they would hand it back to blood bank, who would check it in at their end. You've just spoken about the cold chain concept, and you said in your statement that became more important. Can you give us a little bit more detail on what you mean by the cold chain concept? What, uh, what is that? I'm not entirely sure where the phrase came from. It was a phrase that the blood bank used and we picked up. I, I assume that what it meant was the vital importance of maintaining the blood at an appropriate temperature until the time at which it was administered to the patient. So there was, I think, on the part of the haematology service, there was increasing concern that blood was being you know, left on a, on a trolley or an anaesthetic machine uh, while we decided whether the patient needed it or not, then perhaps put back in the cold box and returned to blood bank. So there was a period when they were unsure as to how it was stored, and that became less acceptable as time went on. You've also said uh, in your statement that there was always two units of O-negative blood um, available in, your, in the blood fridge yes, for use uh, in extreme emergencies. Yes. Do you know how long that blood could be stored before it was used or destroyed? I 
I don't know, but it was managed by the uh, by the, the transfusion, uh, well, by the haematology uh, laboratory. So that blood fridge, as it were, was the responsibility of the blood bank or the haematology. Yes, we had uh, not every unit had this, but but uh, um, uh, uh, we had a, a blood bank fridge in our uh, in our theatre suite, and the blood was stored there, uh, and they were responsible for maintenance of that fridge. And presumably, then also the logging in of the blood and logging out of the blood. That's correct. Yes, well, it was always when it was logged in to the fridge, it was double checked by a member of the theatre team as well. I want to move on to what patients were told uh, in relation to transfusions. Can you recall any situations where the patient wasn't under a general anaesthetic and you gave a blood transfusion? Oh, yes, certainly. I mean, the majority of caesarean sections in the UK, as you will know, are done with the patient awake. Uh, if major problems are anticipated with bleeding or with surgical access, then general anaesthesia would be used in preference. Um, and, of course, if the patient deteriorated unexpectedly during surgery, then we would often induce general anaesthesia in order to control the airway and some of the parameters, the vital sign parameters. Um, but, yes, certainly uh, when uh, things would be, would be beginning to go awry in theatre and blood loss was starting to become uh, extensive, the patient would often still be awake at that point. So at that point, if it was anticipated that a transfusion was going to be needed, what would a patient be told about it? Uh, you'll lo- it's, uh, as I say in my inquiry, essentially, you're losing a lot of blood and we're going to have to give you a blood transfusion. And I think that would be about it. Frankly. Given that very limited information at the time, would anyone follow up with them afterwards to discuss further the, the fact of having had a transfusion? Well, we certainly didn't. And... Um, it's a question that has occurred to me as I've been reading the papers associated with this. Obviously, I think the patient assumed the patient would know that they'd had a transfusion. So we're, these are patients who are very sick, who often require uh, very many units of blood and blood products, who are very ill afterwards and often continue to receive blood in the immediate post, post-operative period when they're awake, even if they were asleep at the time. Um, but whether they're formally notified that they had a blood transfusion is a question that has really occurred to me since uh, getting involved with this now. Whose responsibility do you think it would have been to talk through the fact of the transfusion and the risks arising from the transfusion? I would have to say I think it's the obstetricians. They're the one who, have, who has the relationship with the patient. Uh, although, as we heard in Professor Steer's evidence, uh, evidence the, the, the one-to-one relationship is one that has, has not, been, not been so apparent in, uh, in, in recent decades. Um, and the anaesthetist, uh, despite our, in, our interest in the perioperative period, tends to lose contact with the patient shortly after, the, after they've stabilised uh, and got over their surgery, they're no longer in pain, not feeling sick and vomiting and so on. So I have to say, I think it's the, it's the obstetrician's task, but... but whether that should still be the case is a, is a matter of some consideration, I think. And you may not be able to assist with this, but was that just the practice in Nottingham, or do you, are you aware of whether that was broadly the practice of most anaesthetists? I would suggest it was, it was broad practice throughout the UK. If anything, the anaesthetists in Nottingham were more involved in the entirety of the birth process than in many other centres. Uh, and the type of clinics that Professor Steer was talking about, combined clinics with, an, with anaesthetists, were quite common. We had them in, in the late 80s. Uh, no, early 90s, I would say, uh, in Nottingham, and somewhat earlier than many other places. Uh, so if we weren't getting involved in it there, I suspect other places weren't either. And for a woman who was under general anaesthetic and then needs a transfusion, would the same apply that it would have been the obstetrician, if anyone, who informed her of the transfusion. Yes, and now, of course, I wonder whether they were all appropriately informed. If we take the time frame back a little into situations where there's a preoperative discussion with a woman because it's anticipated she may require blood, there's something in her medical context that you've got involved with her earlier and there's an acceptance that she may require blood uh, when she gives birth. In those situations, you've said in your statement that you wouldn't normally mention a risk of the transmission of disease. Uh, Why is that? Um, I think, thinking back, 
because uh, the risk of transmission was very low. And I've made a comparison uh, in my statement, which may be of help, to the specific consent in relation to all the other interventions that we take during anaesthesia, particularly the administration of multiple drugs, uh, saying that uh, even a standard general anaesthetic would involve perhaps 15 drugs, many of which had potentially very severe side effects, far greater frequency than this particular uh, one. But the idea that you would consent a patient to every single, si single drug you were going to give was really not, not very viable and probably not much help to the patient either. And I think anaesthetists, rightly or wrongly, would think of blood in the same context. It's a, it's a, it's, it's a treatment, it's a drug. It's not a drug, of course, but it's a, it's a substance given intravenously with potential adverse effects. But most of the potential adverse effects we were concerned about were the adverse effects of giving massive, trans, acute effects of giving massive transfusion. And they were substantial, very substantial side effects. Uh, and they, maybe because of the long-term nature of this complication, but it's not something that was forefront in my mind, and I suspect in the mind of other anaesthetists either. And in that context, if a woman um, did uh, contract at hepatitis C, would you have any awareness of that having happened? N none at all. None at all. Because there was absolutely no way for an anaesthetist to no. be aware of it. No, we would. With the the closest we would get to that is that we would follow up. Perhaps unusually in Nottingham, we would follow up patients. We had an anaesthetic clinic for following up patients who had had a, a complex, uh, a, a complex anaesthetic intervention for whatever reason, and that might include women who have had a massive hemorrhage, usually around six weeks after birth. Uh, and so I suppose it could theoretically come to our attention then, but it would be very unlikely to do so. Particularly for those where the incubation period was lengthy. Exactly. I want to look a little bit more broadly about um, how the structure of um, committees operated. You've said in your statement there was always a consultant anaesthetist uh, who sat on the hospital transfusion committee. Yes, as per that recommendation in the association book. Yes. Uh, but you never sat on the committee yourself? No. What information was conveyed to you from that committee? So when we had uh, communication back from the transfusion committee, it always related to the technical aspects, the managerial, the administrative aspects of blood transfusion, if the process for obtaining blood was going to change, if uh, they had uh, new systems in place for providing blood on request faster or it was going to take longer, uh, the uh, the uh, um, availability of coagulation factors, for example. I don't recall ever getting advice on when to transfuse and when not to transfuse. Were there ever any interdepartmental meetings comprising of anaesthetists, obstetri obstetricians, haematologists, surgeons and the hospital blood bank to discuss the collective use of blood and blood products? Not that I recall at all, no. As I've said, there is there is now in my hospital an audit process in place where every patient who receives a transfusion in the peripartum period uh, is included within, a, within a, 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 an audit to ensure it was appropriate at the time, but that certainly wasn't the case in my day. I'm going to come to the dashboard in just one, one moment. Um, with the benefit of hindsight, do you think those sorts of meetings, interdepartmental meetings, would have been useful to you? I think, listen, I think any meeting between multi, multidisciplinary uh, uh, specialties uh, is extraordinarily helpful. We learn, whenever we have such a meeting, we have them with cardiologists regularly. We learn things we didn't know. Uh, but I'm not sure it would have changed the practice that we were employing in any significant way. Uh, as I've said, I don't, I, I, looking back on my time in these cases, I can't think of any patient in whom I initiated a transfusion that I would, knowing what I know now, not have initiated the transfusion. There are some caveats to that. So I've said that, that I would perhaps have not transfused as many units of blood. Uh, and I've said that perhaps in the postpartum period, in the very rare occasions when I was involved in transfusing patients postpartum, I might have decided not to transfuse a patient rather than to transfuse them. Uh, but certainly, I don't think it would have altered our initial response to any massive hemorrhage. But in relation to those two caveats, do you think those interdepartmental meetings might have moderated your practice in terms of how much blood was given or in the postpartum period giving anything? If that subject was addressed, I think um, because it relates very much to the practical aspects of uh, 
with regard to the amount of blood you give, it relates very much to the practical aspects of measuring blood loss in the first place. And that was very much our area. And the haematologist would have no particular expertise in that area at all. Uh, but with regard to, yes, as it were, the, the target you should aim for or the, or the, the trigger at which uh, transfusion should be uh, instituted in the non-emergency situation, yes, I think that would have been very useful. And, and coming on to that dashboard audit data you spoke about, mm. um, first of all, what is the data that's available on that? Well, in relation to blood this has started since I retired, so I'm relying upon uh, uh, anecdotal reporting from a colleague but I'm told that uh, the dashboard now includes uh, uh, every patient who received a transfusion uh, in the peripartum period in our trust, which is a relatively small number, so it's between five and ten per month. Uh, and they are, uh, those data are looked at by haematology, anesthesia and obstetrics to determine whether it was appropriate to give the transfusion and whether an appropriate amount of blood was transfused uh, and will be discussed at multidisciplinary meetings that are probably not involving the haematologists, I suspect. And that, you say, has only just been introduced since, certainly since July 2020? I think, I certainly don't recall it during my time. And was that introduced, do you know, just in Nottingham, or has it been a nationwide development? I don't know whether it's nationwide. I suspect it's a local initiative. You've said in your statement that you think that dashboard data will enable inappropriate or in excessive use of blood or blood products to be highlighted and for learning to be developed from that. Yes. Is there any reason why that couldn't have been introduced earlier? No, frankly, other than uh, the, the pressure on all, all clinicians and all services, particularly the obstetric service, just to keep the ball rolling. It, it's, you know, anything that involves stepping outside the, the, the acute clinical arena to, to learn has always been it's, it's a terribly important time, and it's precious time, but it's time that's very difficult to clear in a normal clinical workload. Uh, and I think Professor Steer may have alluded to that as well. So he talked about the importance of, of uh, continuing professional development nowadays as a, as a, as a means to revalidation. But CPD is a very much a new phenomenon that when I started as a consultant was unheard of. You just read the journals and, and, and kept up with the literature yourself. And f finally, can I turn to NHBT... 00083701 underscore 002. This is a health service circular from 1998 uh, introducing the Better Blood Transfusion Initiative. Is this something you were aware of? Uh, I'm going to have to say no. I don't think I was. And from this circular arose a number of initiatives to promote a best practice in better blood transfusion. Again, it is even the phrasing better blood transfusion initiative something that you came across? I don't even recall the phrase, I'm afraid. Um, but uh, I, and I, 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 I don't recall having seen this in my preparation, but uh, a lot of these documents were related to the efficient use of blood rather than to N n rather than in relation to uh, the risk of transmission of disease. Of course, the two may well go hand in hand. The less blood you transfuse, the less likely you are to transmit disease. So those are the questions I have for Dr Bogod. I'm conscious that uh, those behind me may have additional questions they'd like me to ask. And I wonder if we can take uh, a short break. Uh, yes, well, uh, Dr Bogod will have, will have heard, uh, I think, uh, what, I, what I said to uh, Professor Steer this morning, that um, there is, has to be an opportunity for the, those uh, who, who are uh, represented, uh, who are, see, who are um, core, part, core participants in the inquiry, to put questions through council to you. Uh, and for that purpose, um, ha they will have listened to you. Um, they will largely be here, but they may be uh, elsewhere. Uh, she has to have a chance of picking those questions up um, considering them and, and then asking you. So how long do you think you might need? I think probably um, 15 minutes would suffice, sir. Yes, yeah, so well, let's, let's say then, shall we, um, not, not before half past three. And could you also give Dr Bogod the, the usual I shall. warning? Uh, Dr Bogod, you're giving evidence. The, the rule is that during any break, of which this is obviously one, that you may not discuss with anyone, whoever they are, uh, anything which you have said in evidence or anything which you think you may yet uh, be asked. 
Uh, apart from that, you can say anything you'd like to anyone. Thank you very much, sir. I understand. Half past. Thank you.